Welcome everybody to today's webinar on the topic of technologies in organ donation management. My name is Heidi Aguiar, I'm part of the Alliance team and we welcome you to today's webinar. Um, it's going to be a really great and educational webinar. I hope that many of you will be able to take some useful information away and think about um, some of these technologies and how you might be able to employ them at your organizations. Just before we introduce the speakers, a couple of logistic items. Um, so you are in a participant mode, um, so you will not be able to pose your questions verbally. You can only submit your questions through the chat feature, which is the bottom left-hand corner. That blue bubble, just click on that and submit your questions that way. And you can do it at any time during the webinar. We will just hold them till the end. Also, I wanted to announce on April 18th, we will have our next transplant webinar on the topic of where are all the pancreas transplants? Coming up, um, also for this webinar, we are providing one SEPC credit, and um, we are also providing nursing contact hours, 1.2 nursing contact hours, courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. And um, to receive your continuing education credits, you need to make sure that you complete the evaluation process. So everybody who is listening in a group, some of you are listening together in a group, whoever registered for the webinar will be receiving the evaluation email. Please make sure that you note everybody who is in your group so you can forward that evaluation email to them so that everyone who's listening can receive their continuing education credits. At this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today. Our moderator is Evilio Matos. Um, he is a member of our Get Connected webinar faculty, and he's an organ recovery coordinator and safety officer at the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm going to turn it to Evilio to introduce our speakers for today. Thanks so much, Heidi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have the honor today to introduce uh, uh, two uh, great coordinators um, that works uh, in in our field. Uh, first one will be uh, Ms. Uh, Stacy Linderman. Uh, she uh, is a clinical supervisor and clinical educator with the Texas Organ Sharing Alliance. She has been with TOSA since 2006. Uh, she graduated um, out of Texas Tech Health Science Centers with a Bachelor's of Science degree in nursing. She has nine years of experience in adult critical care trauma nursing to include five years as an interventional cardiac cath lab nurse. She uh, worked as an organ recovery coordinator and quality assurance analyst for, year, for six years with TOSA before, before moving into the clinical educator role in 2012. In 2013, uh, she became a clinical supervisor with TOSA. In her spare times, she enjoys watching movies and spending time with her family. I uh, also would like to introduce uh, Bo Crudur. He is an advanced practice coordinator with the Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. He has spent the last eight years with the organization with certifications for both CPTC and CCRN. Prior to that, he worked in the intensive care unit as a registered nurse for five years. He graduated cum laude from the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Go Cajuns! Uh, and now let me uh, introduce Stacy. Uh, please take it away. Thanks, Avilio. Um, so we're going to talk about technologies and organ donation management. And we're going to go over what is health technology, where to find these health technologies, how to implement new technologies, how to assess the efficiency in donor management, how to measure cost efficiency and value. I'm going to go over a quick case study with the Cheetah Starling Monitor, and then at the end going to discuss a couple other technologies that are available out there. But first of all, I want to talk about the definition of what is health technology. Health technology is defined by the World Health Organization as the application of organized knowledge and skills in the form of devices, medicines, vaccines, procedures, and systems developed to solve health problems and improve quality of life. So where do we find these health technologies? Well, our CEO, Joe Nespra, is always open to suggestions. 
we are constantly looking at what technologies are out there and how this is, can benefit our mission. So this open door policy that we have um, always brings up ideas for discussion and that definitely in includes what types of technologies are out there. So we have received many recommendations on technologies that could be useful for us from websites, our hospital partners, our clinical staff, and the management team. But some other places that you may not think about um, where we've received these are from social media, publications, clinical trials, and definitely other OPOs. So the implementation of new technologies, how do we implement this? Well, our process to implement technologies begins well before the rollout. We analyze the potential benefit for our clinical staff, taking into consideration the size, the weight, the maintenance, and the cost. Some of the equipment we have started to use is the portable scanners for our clinical staff. This was put into place to alleviate a constant issue at some of our hospitals where we had difficulty faxing paperwork. With these scanners, they are able to scan paperwork directly onto their computers and then email it out as opposed to getting papers jammed in the fax machine or waiting for it to fax all the way through. Others, such as the Cheetah Starling cardiac monitor, this has taken a more measured approach. So our implementation for the clinical technologies start with meeting the company rep. We get to know them and they get to know what we do. We then get the staff recommendations as to whether the equipment will serve our goals. Once we have the staff buy-in, we implement an education plan for those who will use the equipment. We develop a test protocol for the staff to follow and work out any issues or kinks. We introduce the equipment to the hospital staff, our transplant partners, and other OPOs as needed. And finally, we look for ways to measure our efficiency and process. And this can be done by collecting data and lots of discussion between our clinical staff and our medical director. Technology efficiency for donor management. So some of our issues um, with this is most health technologies out there are geared towards organ donation, are not geared towards, but they can be implemented for organ donors. Most companies we talk to do not really understand what we do, so therefore education is a very important role when talking to them. Another issue is that there's little research available um, done on organ donor patients. They're mostly done on regular patients that are in the ICUs or patients who have chronic conditions, et cetera. Um, then once we talk about that, then we need to find out what normal, what is normal for our organ donors with the input from our transplant physicians. Efficiency and value proposition for the OPO. So next we look at what our partner hospitals are currently using at the bedside and what services are available to us. We then assess how we can become more efficient by utilizing our own equipment and services and becoming less dependent on our hospitals. By becoming more efficient and streamlined, it has the potential to reduce case time, our cost, and most importantly, it maximizes organs transplanted per donor. By being more aggressive with our donor management and utilizing our own equipment and technologies, we have the ability to foresee any potential problems with our donors. In addition, some of these technologies may assist in evaluating some of our potential expanded donor pool. And within that do expanded pool would be such as the older donor, um, donors would have a very high BMI or, uh, or chronic illnesses. So let's look at the case study, the Cheetah Starling Monitor. One of the technologies we started to use is the Cheetah Monitor. Two years ago, we needed to replace our previous system, and we started to look at the updated version as well as others. One of our hospitals utilized, utilizes a Cheetah, and we approached them for some feedback. The feedback was great. We contacted the company, and soon after we met with the regional rep, Kimberly Barnish. After that, after that meeting in person and learning about the capabilities, we decided to trial the Cheetah. 
one of the biggest selling points for us was that it was non-invasive monitor that utilizes the bioreactants through electrodes as opposed to the need for having an arterial line as the Vigileo we used previously. Because it does not require arterial lines, we were able to use the monitor not for only brain dead patients, but also for our DCD donors as well. With the TINA monitor, we were able to obtain a cardiac output, a cardiac index, an SV, an SVI, and an SVV measurement, as well as the SVR and the SVRI, and these can help with maintaining our donor at all times. So as part of the evaluation process, we have used our cheetah at hospitals that utilize the Vigileo system, and we place both of them on the same patient during the same case. And our experience is that the numbers correlated perfectly. After we did our due diligence, we moved to the cheetah system, and now we have the system in place in all three regions. As an organization, we have been able to reduce our costs close to 50% of our previous system. In addition to that, the company's customer service has been top-notch, and we have developed a fantastic working relationship with Cheetah Medical. Uh, this is just a picture of what the Cheetah Starling Monitor looks like. Um, the benefits to this is it's pretty compact, pretty much lightweight. It is a touch screen on it. Um, the numbers are bright, and you can see them easily, and it is Wi-Fi capable. So we just added a picture of here, the cheetah. So thinking outside the box, um, some other technologies that we currently use or are in the process of reviewing are um, the cell phones. We currently use cell phones to send photos, secured emails, um, scanning capabilities are also on the cell phones that the coordinators have. We also are currently using the portable bronchoscope with very good success, and we have found that this really helps with case time. Um, instead of having to wait for the GI team to come down and set up the bronchoscope in the room, we already have it set up for when the physician arrives to do the bronch at bedside. And then we also have this available in the ORs, for um, when the lung transplant team comes, it's already set up, and then we are, again, we're not waiting for another team to arrive. Another thing that we are currently um, using, one of our ORCs is currently utilizing, is the Bluetooth-enabled stethoscope, and he's able to record lung and heart sounds on that stethoscope. And the last thing on there is CompuMed. We are currently using CompuMed with great success. Uh, we use them they're reading our echoes and our EKGs, but in the near future, we're going to be utilizing them in reading our chest X-rays and CTs, and this will definitely cut down on case times, and it will have, be able to have one company reading all of our scans instead of several different hospitals. So from our point of view, all of these have the ability to enhance our process and the ability to carry our mission out more efficiently. That's all I have. Thank you. Bo, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> like you said, my name is Bo Prater, and I'm an advanced practice coordinator here at the Louisiana Organ Procurement Agency. And I'm here today to talk a little bit about the latest technology we have implemented here at LOPA. Now, before I get started, I do have a little disclaimer. Unfortunately, I am not paid or do I have any financial interest in any of these companies that are going to be mentioned in this presentation. Uh, the three things that I'd like to talk about that we're doing here is the coordinator-driven echocardiograms. Uh, last summer, we also started using the Cheetah Monitor as well. And we do local device photography. I'd like to start um, a little, talking a little bit about the challenges we have for obtaining echoes whenever we're inside of a donor hospital. As many of you know, our cases rarely start at 8 o'clock in the morning. So by the time that the patient is echo ready, they've been given their medicine, they're down on their pressure, it's usually well into the afternoon. 
And I don't know about everywhere else, but here in Louisiana, for some reason, after 5 o'clock, it can be quite hard to get a cardiologist to come out and do the read. We've even tried to go as far as burn a disc and put it in a taxi cab to their house, but we still weren't getting the echoes read in a timely manner. So then we're waiting till 6, 7, 8 o'clock the next morning and pushing our case times longer so it's costing more money. And it also increases the chance of the patient becoming unstable and maybe losing out on organs. Another thing we get pushed back on was the serial echoes. Some of our cardiologists don't understand the brain dead donor heart like we do, that the ejection fraction will actually increase over time. So when we're calling him back out, he'll make comments like, it's been just 10 hours since the last echo. It's going to be the same. I'm not coming out and do it again. So it was very difficult. Also, it would be nice if we'd be able to get a, the transplant center uh, a copy of the echo to be able to view it before they came out on site and looked at it at the heart and the OR. Um, another big issue was inconsistent cardiologist reads. Like, I know one cardio uh, uh, cardiologist personally that has told me um, he feels responsible for what happens to the recipient and doesn't want to give the ejection fraction. He's scared to overread it. So a lot of times they're under-reading, which can cause for less hearts being placed. Then we discovered this company, CompuMed, and they were offering 24-hour, seven-day-a-week reads, and they would get them to us in less than one hour. The biggest benefit of CompuMed, I have to say, is that ability for the transplant center to view the echoes remotely through remote access. It's really twofold. It's very, very easy to do. All I need is an email from a coordinator from the transplant team or uh, or the cardiologist, and with a simple couple clicks, I can send them a link and they can view the entire echo just as if they did the echo in their own hospital. Um, the, the, the reason I say it's twofold is I had two examples. One where it was a very marginal heart and the heart team was actually getting ready to code out. So I was able to send them uh, the guest link. They were clicked on it and viewed it. And it was actually good enough from the echo that they saw versus what the report said for them to come out, take a look at the heart, and ended up uh, taking it and transplanting it. Another thing is it actually saves on money because just two weeks ago, we had a, a young patient whose wall thickness was on the thicker side, and they didn't quite believe the measurements that the, uh, the echo reading had, so they were requesting a second echo. So I was able to just send them the guest link, they looked at it, and, and take their own measurements. And that ended up saving us time and money from doing the second echo. Also, CompuMed, their price is very com uh, competitive with the hospital reads. And, and importantly, you have the same group of doctors that are very familiar with reading these echoes that are um, reading all of them. If you look here, I uh, uploaded a screenshot of what it looks like whenever they log in to look at the echo. And like I said, it's a complete echo. It has motion. It has measurements. Um, everything that you would normally have, like I said, a, on an echo done in their hospital. So what we did next is we decided to trial CompuMed for three months. We just wanted to make sure that everything they offered was, was valid, and they actually delivered above and beyond expectation. Their customer support is second to none. Great, great guys to work with. However, the issue we were having, a small percentage of our hospitals don't have echo techs on call at night. And then we even had some others that even though they had echo techs on call, if we call them out at 1 or 2 in the morning, they wouldn't get into the hospital till 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. So it was still these cases were being expanded to go longer and longer. So one day I was watching an echo tech do an echo on one of our cases, and I thought to myself, well, that couldn't be too hard. That shouldn't be too difficult. Why, why can't we do that? So I picked up the phone and I called Dr. Ram Dandelion. He was the uh, head, cardiology, head of the cardiology group that was working with CompuMed at the time. And it just so happened that he was the medical director for the West Coast Ultrasound Institute. So he made a few phone calls with the institute and CompuMed. And they were able to develop a course that basically condensed 
an entire 12 to 18 month echo class into about five days. And they did it using the specific views that we use for, um, for heart donation. One other little perk that I wanted to share is that the Institute is also in Beverly Hills. All I'm going to say is that it's a very, very fun place to go to train. <laughs> I think that's all I'm allowed to say. But I actually did um, find out recently also on a side note that CompuMed is now looking to do on-site training. I know this is something new. I don't know a lot about it, but you could inquire to maybe have them come on site and do the training there instead of if you don't want to go to Beverly Hills. So we got together for the first class, and myself and one other APC from LOPA went along with two coordinators from TOSA. And let me tell you, this class was very intense. It was four hours of uh, class work in the morning, followed by four straight hours of lab work in the afternoon. And if you look at the picture at the bottom, it's very similar to a picture the cardiologist had showed us uh, on the first day of class. And he said, this class will be like trying to drink through a fire hydrant. It's a whole lot of information and just try and soak up what you can. And I laughed at the time, um, thinking that it was funny, but boy, was he right. Like an example, the first four hours of class was completely dedicated to the physics involved with echoes. And I don't know how many of y'all watch the Big Bang Theory, but I'm not Sheldon Cooper. So it set up the stage for a lot of studying involved. We actually got our machines after we got home, and I can't stress enough how important it is to practice, practice, practice. Um, we practice on fellow coworkers, friends, families. Uh, I echoed my wife probably a dozen times. I even did my dog once. Um, you couldn't practice enough. And once we got comfortable, uh, we would send our scans to Dr. Dandelion, and he would review them for us and give us feedback. Um, another thing we do is when we had a donor, we would actually scan the patient after the echo tech at the hospital did the echo, and we can compare the results to make sure our views and our measurements were in line with what they were getting. And I have to say, I have a new respect for um, the people that do those echoes because the hand strength it takes is, is unimaginable to keep it in one spot for so long. But boom, all that hard work eventually did pay off, and we did get certified. So let's talk about the cost involved. The Beverly Hills training was $3,500 per person. Uh, that's not including the flights or the hotels. And we chose to go with the GE Vivid E Echo machine. I put a picture here so you can get an idea of its size. And it's about the size of an old school laptop computer. And if you would happen to go with this, I highly recommend this case because it's very rugged and durable because um, you know we do a lot of travel in this line of work. But the machine did cost 25 grand, and that was for one. And we happened to purchase two of them. So you might say to yourself, how can this really be worth it with this much upfront cost? Well, I took the data from when we started in 2014 through 2016. And all our echoes that were done by an APC and read by CompuMed, the average cost was $367. When an echo was done by the hospital and read by their cardiology group, the average cost was $696. So you're looking at saving an average of $329 per echo, which is significant, doesn't sound that impressive at first. However, we have five APCs trained now, and we're on pace to have 100 uh, echoes read by a coordinator just this year. So that's $33,000 in hard cost just this year alone. That's pretty impressive. And the reason I say hard cost is because this is the easy numbers to calculate when we're just, but there's other things that we're saving on that it's much harder to put into dollars. One of those things is time. Over that same time period, the average time it took from consent to an echo, whenever we were doing the echoes and CompuMed was reading, was nine hours and 16 minutes. The average time when the hospital did the echo um, and their cardiology group read it was 16 hours and 45 minutes. 
That's seven and a half hours sooner whenever we're doing the echoes. So they say time is money, but in this instance, I think time is actually worth more than the money because you, you have staff burnout. That can be an issue in some places, if, and we can get cases finished sooner. You're spending more money on meds, lab work, and maybe even ICU time. So it's hard to quantify, but there's definitely a savings there. So what about live saves? Well, if we look at our hearts transplanted and our hearts transplanted per donor, as you can see, they've increased every year since we've put this into practice. Another reason our hearts may have increased our, all our organs, uh, for that matter, is the cheetah monitor. We started using the cheetah monitor last summer and like Stacy talked about before, we also previous, previously used the flow track monitor. When comparing the two, there's really no comparison. The, the flow track monitor hooks up to an art line. So straight off the bat, it could have a variability if the, due to the placement of the art line. We found it gave us different numbers if the patient was on a lot of pressors like your dopamine and levofed. Um, and then we do a lot of uh, recruitment maneuvers on our vent, which increase the intrathoracic pressure a lot, and it would throw all the numbers on the flow track off. Whereas you find with the cheetah monitor, everything just stays steady the whole time, and it's much easier to set up. As you can see, it's just four simple pads on the chest, and that's it, um, and you're off to, to go. I know she talked about this earlier, but I just to give you an overview, these are the hemodynamic parameters that we monitor here at LOPA. Um, basically, it's giving you the same numbers that you'd get off a of Swan's GANS catheter. Probably the most useful tool that we, we find with the Cheetah Monitor is the Fluid Challenge. And basically, it's a, a three to five minute challenge either doing a passive leg raise or a fluid bolus. And what it does is it ca actually calculates your donor and puts their fluid balance on the starling curve. And as you can see in the picture, I gave an example on the right um, that this patient's very dry, it's a low on the curve. But the machine, as you know, it's, it's difficult with a brain dead donor sometimes to treat fluid status. Um, the I's and O's aren't always accurate and you don't know if you need to give more fluid, fluid diuresia patient, uh, start an inotrope, and the machine does all the, all the thinking for you, so it takes the guesswork out. And just to give you some data, I pulled our data since we started using um, in August 2016 through January of this year. So if you look at the percentage of donor management goals that we meet on average per case, whenever we don't have the cheetah monitor, it's 92%, and it's marginally better when we do have the cheetah monitor. But if you look at the bottom, it's really important because this is huge. When you look at the SRTR expected organs recovered per donor versus what we actually observe, it's pretty flat whenever we don't have the cheetah monitor. We basically recover what we're expected to recover. But since we've been using the cheetah monitor with those cases, we're actually recovering 0.66 more organs than expected per donor on average. So if you extrapolate that over 180 cases, that's a lot more lives saved. The uh, last piece of technology I'd like to talk about is our local device photography. And this is something we've been playing around with for the past couple of years, and we finally have it streamlined in the policy. It came about a lot of transplant centers um, always asking for pictures of chest x-rays, CT scans, biopsy slides, are the visuals on the organs. <clears throat> so just like our cardiologists, we find that the pathologists tend to also read on the side of caution. Multiple times just this year alone, we've had a pathologist read a liver biopsy slide um, as 50% macro fat. And then what we do is we actually photograph that slide through the microscope eyepiece, the same exact slide, upload it and let the transplant center look at it. And their hepatologist will look at it and actually read it sometimes at 
So that's a huge difference. That's the difference between that liver finding a home or not. Um, another reason that we use this technology is, like I said, is if we have a marginal organ in the OR, and let's say the transplant center couldn't fly out uh, to recover it for themselves, they might want to see a visual before they make a decision on that organ. And what we're trying to do is give all the transplant centers the most information that we can so that they can make a confident decision for their recipient. I put here at the top, keeping it simple, um, <laughs> because, like I said, over the last couple of years, we've tried several things to do these, what I've been talking about, and we use a lot of different apps and softwares, but they were very complicated, or their upload times took, took a long time to load. So it made it hard for us to become routine in practice. So when they were thinking, why can't we use the technology that everybody already has on site, every coordinator already has, instead of trying to go outside and source it. So we did, and we actually started with our cell phones, and it worked great. And like I said, we, we've come into policy, and we decided even though we don't take pictures of patient identifiers, such as their face or wristbands, that we were just going to use LOPA-approved devices. So all of our coordinators, when they start a case, have a Microsoft Surface Pro that has a camera, and we use those to take pictures of the chest x-rays and the CT scans. And we also have an um, iPad mini that goes with our coordinators into every OR, because those we find are a little bit easier for taking pictures through the microscope and also for the organ visuals. And what we do is after we take the photograph, we can actually upload it from those devices straight to DonorNet, and then just let the uh, transplant center know it's there, and they can go ahead and look at those pictures. And for my last slide, I did include the equipment that we used, just in case anyone's never seen one of these before. Um, and thank you all for your time, and if anybody has any questions, I would be glad to answer them. Thank you, Bo, for... Um the, this great information, and Stacy for um, framing the webinar for us. Um, to all of the participants, if you have questions for Bo or Stacy, please go ahead and um, submit your questions through that blue um, icon on the bottom left-hand corner, that chat icon. Just type in your question, and uh, we will be receiving it on our end. And so while the questions are going on, I will be putting up this poll. Many of you are listening in groups. For those of you listening in a group, if you can please um, go ahead and submit how, people, how many people are in your group while we're um, navigating the Q&A time. Evilio, I see a couple of questions in the queue, so I will turn it to you um, to, address, uh, to navigate those questions so the speakers can address them. Thanks so much. Uh, one of our questions uh, came, which was very interesting, and is uh, for both both uh, Bo and Stacy. Is uh, have you guys encountered any issues bringing your OPO equipment into the donor hospital? Um, Avilio, I can answer that. This is Stacy. Um, we haven't really ran into a lot of issues because due to the preparation process. Um, they're always very curious and interested to see what new devices we have. Um, but our HD department does a great job in going in and prepping them and letting them know um, about what's coming. And then when our clinical staff is there, they do an excellent job in showing the nurses and the staff um, all about it and teaching them whatever they want. So we really haven't ran into many issues with, at TOSA. But how about you in LOPA? Any issues with your hospitals? Um, we actually never had any issues with our hospitals. I would say my biggest fear was actually damaging the equipment after we paid for it. Uh, but as far as our hospitals, we've never had any issues. Uh, like I said, we do label all our equipment appropriately. But other than that, no pushback from our hospitals. Thank you. Uh, another question, this one is for Bo, is how do you take uh, photos uh, of the biopsy slides? Well, what we do is we use the iPad mini, 
And so you can actually see from the screen side what's looking through the camera. And you would use the camera just like your eye looking through the microscope hole. So the same slide that the pathologist read, you just have them leave it in that one spot. And you put the iPad mini on the eyepiece. And when you line it up, you just click the button, take the picture, and upload it. It does take a little practice. Thanks so much. Uh, another question, and this is uh, for both coordinators for the, uh, the, both transfer centers uh, of yours is, uh, how do you carry the equipment load? Uh, Stacy, you want to answer that one? <laughs> sure, I hear you laughing. So our coordinators basically pile it all up on a dolly and um, load it into their car, but it takes a pretty good sized car because we carry um, several bags, a cheetah monitor, all of our equipment, plus their, their own personal stuff. So a um, lot of stuff on a dolly, then a big enough car to carry it there. But we do take it into the hospitals with us and find a good place and um, somewhere on the unit where it's kind of out of the way and it stays with us. And then we just load it up and bring it back to the office once the donor case is completed. Thank you. And Bud, do you um, do you guys have a special uh, carry-on equipment as well, or how do you guys carry your stuff? Yeah, it's very, very similar to what she said. We have one of those, like, Costco wagon-looking things where we just load it up and kind of pull it behind us. There, but much the same way in a big vehicle, and everything else is pretty much the same. Thanks. Uh, this question is uh, for Bo. How long did it take uh, to fully train and sign off uh, for the ECHO, to, uh, to perform the ECHOs for you, for the APCs and LOPA? Um, it took anywhere from two to six months, depending. Um, I would say the biggest thing is practice. Um, some of our coordinators, our APCs, didn't get to practice as much as the others just because of machine availability. And that was probably the biggest thing. Uh, as long as you're practicing, you know, every night, you can, in less than two months, you should become comfortable. Because once you get the hang of it, it's something that's fairly easy to do once you have the grasp of it. Thank you. Um, another question, um, and it's for both uh, Stacy and Bo, is, uh, with the use of these technologies, have you found uh, that, you, that your OPO has become more efficient uh, utilizing your own technology versus having hospitals uh, provide the service and why? So, Bo, go ahead. Yes, uh, absolutely. Our, from all levels, really. Um, even our coordinators love using like the CompuMed echo reads just because they're so much faster and efficient. Um, we, we definitely are seeing more hearts transplanted. Um, also using the cheetah monitors, like I said, for um, assessing the fluid balance when you don't have to think as hard when it does a lot of the thinking for you is nice. Uh, and just the, the taking the pictures on the biopsies alone has transplanted multiple extra livers for us. So I would say it's definitely helped. And Stacy, have you found the same uh, at TOSA? Yes, absolutely. Um, pretty much the same thing that Bo said, but definitely cuts down on case time. We're not having to wait around for cardiologists to come read our echoes and such things. Um, and, and we're also finding that we are transplanting more organs as well due to the case time and being able to be more efficient with the diff different kinds of testing. Um, another question that has, was uh, placed to us was, um, what's, what was the price of the cheetah monitor? Um, Bo, um, if, I don't know if you, guys, if you know the price uh, uh, or how much you guys paid when, when you guys bought it. That I'm not sure of. That went to our finance people. Uh, I'm not sure of the actual price that we paid. Uh, Stacy, do you know how much y'all's were? I don't, but I know Avilio does. 
So the uh, their uh, their sticker price, if you will, uh, on the chips, I believe is anywhere between twenty five and thirty five thousand um, dollars. When we uh, when we made uh, contact with the company, uh, we bought uh, we bought two. Uh, we rented one, um, and we bought um, I believe it was about one hundred and fifty two hundred sensors. At the time, so we we got a package deal, and I'm not sure as to how it came, but it, it was less than than the than the sticker price. Um, but that's something that um, I know that they'll work with your OPO um, to uh, to make some type of of, of price arrangements. Um, but I know this about twenty five thousand dollars per sticker price, I believe. Uh, it may be a little bit more right now, but that was when we started doing it. Right now, we as an OPO, we have five of them here. And uh, we buy our supplies at the beginning of the year for throughout the whole, um, or try to add, have the supplies for the whole year. So we bought about 150, 200 sensors this past year, this past January. Vilio, I have a question uh, as well for Bo. Um, in terms of, you know, like you said, just keeping it simple and using the technology you have on hand, has that uh, pretty much become routine practice now for you all to take just always pictures with your phones or with the mini iPads through the microscope and of the X-rays, et cetera, and, and what has been the response from the transplant centers? Or the surgeons, I should say. Both um, in in your case, what's been the response from your from your docs uh, taking the pictures of the biopsies? Do they find that that it works better? Do they obviously they're getting a different read? I'm taking is that oh, the case? Oh, I just got a message that Bo got disconnected. <laughs> okay. oh. um, so hopefully he can get back in here um, in just a minute. Uh, as an ORC, um, my experience uh, when we send the pictures, um, it's it's a lot of our doctors when we're doing uh, lung recruitments or or taking certain pictures of of CTs uh, for them, they find it useful if they're at home, um, not having um, to try to log in uh, to the system or or waiting to, they get to the hospitals to be able to to get those images. Uh, so, from my personal point, um, the times that I've that I've sent um, chest X-rays to to the pulmonologist through our secure email, um, they they li they like it. They they're able to more or less diagnose based on those pictures and and give us recommendations as to how to how to proceed. Thank you, uh, Bo. Are you back in? Yes, I'm back. Okay, great. We, I, I was just asking the question in terms of um, what is is it routine practice now for your staff to utilize the cell phones or the mini iPads, et cetera, to take pictures through the microscope and of the images, and what has been the response from the transplant surgeons? Yes, it's, it's pretty routine now. They, they pretty much ask for it now on almost most cases. Any case that they're getting a biopsy, they we're uploading it so they can look at it. Great, and they're happy with it. Oh yeah, the, the, the image actually comes out very clear. It's just like looking at it with the eye. All right, great, thank you. Bo, uh, and another question on on, on your specific on on that uh, technology of taking the picture of the slides. Have you found or has Lopa found that the reads of the biopsy done at hospitals versus the visual reads that, that your transplant surgeons do differ greatly? It depends. Um, we do see it root. I mean, it's not something very uncommon. Um, like I said, I think it's because the pathologist is scared to read it maybe uh, too low, or they just, but, but, or maybe the, the transplant center hepatologist reads so many specific liver biopsies, they're maybe just more proficient. But they do vary more time, I, I would say several times a year. Thank you. Um, 
And I know that uh, I have another question. Is uh, I think for Stacy, but I think it applies to Bo as well. And I know Stacy had mentioned um, that this technology assists or helps OPOs um, to works with the with the expanded donor pool to be able to um, to see whether um, those donors that we're looking for expanded are are, are will be suitable candidates for organ donation. Uh, Stacy, what's the donor pool like um, in the San Antonio area, where you may use this technology to kind of um, see if they if they are uh, a good candidate for organ donation? I'm sorry. It looks like Stacy also got disconnected. How about Bo? Do you have um, do you have an extended donor pool in in Louisiana that this um, technology has helped you um, to expand your donors your donors uh, per area? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Especially like the the liver boxes because we have a lot of um, very marginal liver patients here. Um, uh, not to say that our population here in Louisiana is very unhealthy, but we do have a lot of marginal livers, and uh, it, it helps that we have Oshner's a very big transplant center, so they take a look at a lot of these biopsies, and, and it does help us place more of these uh, expanded criteria livers. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll say that here in San Antonio, we we tend to have a a, a more chronic population. Uh, we have a, a lot of higher BMIs, um, a lot of uh, diabetes and um, hypertension. A lot of our our, our referrals. Uh, so utilizing these technologies um, assist us to determine whether uh, these uh, potential donors will become you know, will be a good donor or marginal donor, but a donor that we can move forward versus versus rule them out uh, for donation uh, based on the history and, and the information that we get from, from these new technologies. And Heidi, I don't have any more questions. Do you have any other questions for us? No, I don't. I don't see any further in the queue. But um, lots of great questions, and um, thank you to Stacy and Bo for, and also Vilio for helping out with the questions. Um, ironically, for some reason today we're having some technical <laughs> issues with the webinar platform. Uh, gotta love irony, right? Um, but thank you to everybody for um, patiently participating, and I hope that you got a lot of great info about the various technologies available and. I think um, one thing that I'm certainly taking away is go back to being simple sometimes about things and see what you have available to you. Um, but obviously there are always great new technologies out there that are worth checking out and sometimes they pay off um, in the long term. So um, I want to thank all the participants uh, for, for joining us today. I wish you all a wonderful day and for all the speakers, we're going to move us back into the speaker room. And um, we'll see you next time on the next webinar. Take care and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.